Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Duda webinar. I am Nava Hopkins, and I am delighted to be joined by our main panelist um, and my wonderful boss, Fred Vallis, um, the CEO and co-founder of Optimizer, instead of an, an Optimizer takeover of Duda. Cheers, Fred. I know. What kind of panel is this with one speaker? I feel <laughs> like, uh, we should call it a presentation. Uh, or a teaching session. Like I'm excited to talk about GPT and everything we've been doing about it. But yeah, it's great to have you as my moderator, and we'll uh, you can ask me some cool questions. Maybe I'll be like, "No, you asked me that last week, and or like one on one at work. Why are you asking me again?" Oh, it's for the benefit of all the people watching. So funny story. Um, we sometimes will record our one on ones because when the two of us just start talking about what's going on in, in the industry, it just it, it turns into essentially a podcast. Uh, would love to find out where folks are tuning in from. Uh, say hi. Uh, note that just from my, a bit of housekeeping. If you have a question that you're like, oh my God, I really, really want to ask this, put it in the chat, we'll bubble it up. Um, this webinar is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to have a presentation, but there's actually going to be some live coding, live prompt engineering. So if you have some ideas of things that you really would love to see Fred troubleshoot live or script live, put them in the chat as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, if, if you don't ask, the group can't benefit. So without any further ado, Fred, do you want to kick it off? Well, I, I want to say bonjour. Um, so I'm originally from Belgium, came to California, Silicon Valley about 30 plus, yeah, 31 years ago. I love it here in the Silicon Valley. So, But uh, I do speak a little French and a little Flemish. Also see some people watching from the UK, England. I don't speak that accent. Uh, now that you do a British accent. It would be really insulting if I tried. It would, it okay, would come off really badly. Uh, the only accent yeah. I have is is Boston oh. and Rhode Island that kind of warped my used to be neutral voice. Okay, and we have dogs. So let's mute Nava and uh, let's show my slides and let's talk about GPT a little bit. So uh, what we have in mind here for the uh, the session today is turning PPC onto autopilot and how to combine two of the coolest technologies that we've seen in digital marketing. And one of them I've been talking about for over 10 years, and that's Google ad scripts. Now, these are little technical pieces of code. It's basically based around JavaScript. And I think there's a little bit of fear sometimes with marketers to actually deploy those scripts or, or know how to write them themselves. But thanks to GPT, it's now possible to just have a conversation with the chat assistant and build the code for you or take somebody else's code and if it's not working fix it and so we're going to go through some live examples of how that is done uh, as far as the flow of the presentation i'll take you through the agenda in just a minute but we'll have a little bit of an introduction to gpt and generative ai then we'll go into the demos and then we'll save roughly 15 minutes for questions but i do invite all those questions to come in the chat along the way i definitely don't want to lose anyone along the way right so if there's a question that you feel like i need to get that answered right now we'll try to answer that on the spot if it's sort of a broader question we'll take those towards the end all right so um my name like nava said i'm, uh, I'm nava's boss i'm the ceo and one of the co-founders at optimizer and i've been doing ppc in some capacity since 1998, uh, so before, well, actually it was the year Google was born, but I was at Stanford, I was in my dorm room basically buying affiliate links to drive traffic to eBay uh, and some other players. Uh, and I was also selling like video cassettes that I got from Blockbuster, if anyone remembers what Blockbuster is. Nava, you remember Blockbuster? Oh, do I. Uh, we actually have some Blockbuster videos that, that didn't quite make it back before they closed. Oh, I would love one of those if, uh, if you want. I want to share that with me. So, uh, and I, I hit I hit the mouse here, so we're on to the next slide already. But in the in the vein of GPT and generative AI, I thought let me step back from the screen for a minute and uh, let me have my fully cloned avatar, which is it's a clone voice, it's a clone image, it's a generated video. So nothing about this is real, even the script of what fake Fred's going to say was gener generated by AI. So all I had to do was feed it some, uh, like a photo of what I looked like, but then everything beyond that was done through generative AI, which is, which is stuff I couldn't have done in the past, but let me show it to you first, and then we'll talk about it a bit more. So uh, maybe let's go full screen on this one, and then I'll hit the play button. 
who is ready to use generative AI to take their PPC game to the next level. I'm Barbie Fred and I'm very good at Beach. So I always like to say a well-optimized PPC campaign is like sunscreen. It prevents your budget from getting burnt. But besides that, I don't know much about PPC. So here to share what he's learned is the real world Fred. And so again, this is not actually my real voice. This was a cloned voice where I fed a sample of some of the webinars that I've done. Um, I gave it to a program we use that's called Descript and that cloned my voice. And then I used chat GPT and I said, can you do something in the vein of like, if Ken from the Barbie movie, whose main job is quote unquote beach, what would he have to say about PPC? Like write me a joke about that. So then that uh, got me the script. So I got the script, gave that to the voice clone. The voice clone generated that uh, the speech. And then I took an image of myself and I said, can you turn that into a, a barbified version where I look more like Ken? So I came up with one of these and that was a static image. And then I took that static image uh, together with the voice. Um, so the, the audio segment that I had and I put it into a fourth software and that had as its job to animate the face and make the lips move to the script. And so that's what you got out of there. Uh, but again, why for me this was so cool is that I'm not an animator. I'm not a graphics person. Like this is stuff I couldn't have conceived even doing. But the ideas are there, right? And I think as marketers, we have so many ideas and so many creative things we want to pursue, but it's hard for us to sometimes do this. Now, what you see here, like, is not the most polished thing, but I could show this to a, an animator, a graphics person, and I could say, can you take that to the next level? Like, we want to make this a consistent thing. We want to build a series about around Barbie Fred and his PPC adventures, right? But it, it's much more concrete than just kind of trying to explain that to a person. Um, Nava, before I jump into some PPC examples, like any anything from you, like really cool Gen AI stuff you've tried? Uh, so there's actually a, a really good question around the tools used. So I want to make sure that we don't lose uh, okay. that that question. Uh, but just in terms of generative AI, uh, any of you who know me know I'm an avid Star Wars fan. And so I created ad copy um, around uh, Korriban Academy, um, specifically around recruiting people for different levels of Sith tiers. Um, and then I took the ads and put it into some of the fun image generators, like show me the applicants. There, there were some really fun, fun applicants. Nice. So yeah, I mean, as far as that question, we can pop it back on the screen, but the technologies used, there were four of them. So one of them was Descript, which is a video editor that did the voice cloning. Um, thumbs up apparently, the AI got it wrong again. It thinks I'm giving a thumbs up and I'm just counting. I'm a European, so I count with my thumb. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> There was Descript, then I used uh, Lenza, which is the app that takes photos from your phone and then turns them into different avatars. Uh, that was about $5. Descript is about a $20 monthly service fee. Then I used uh, DID, which is the, the stamp you see on that video. It's a, a D Studio that does the generation of combining the voice with the image to turn it into a video. Um, Oh, and then I use ChatGPT to write the script. So there, there's your four. So those were the technologies. One thing um, before we move on, um, one of the reasons I love this example uh, is that it shows generative AI in a way that is usable in marketing and it's usable in content generation. There's a lot of questions around what tools you can use and what you can't use in co for commercial application. Uh, so again, there was a really great conversation around Copilot uh, and Microsoft's uh, forays there. Definitely make sure as you're playing with tools that you know what rights uh, are applicable and what are not applicable. You know, that this is a fluid conversation, uh, but I think this is a really great example of the cool translating into actionable and doable. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, you do bring up a couple of good topics that, you know, maybe I can touch on briefly now and we'll come back to later, but um, it's not just about the rights that you have or who have, who owns the copyright. So basically they're in the United States, they've said works cannot be copyrighted that were made by machines. A work has to be created by a human. So obviously there's a lot of human plus machine working together and that maybe is still more of a gray space. But one of the bigger concerns for us is if we're gonna start using generative AI for a customer's ads account, we do have to feed some of that data back into chat GPT. And so that is, uh, there's privacy issues around that, right? So you wanna be very clear with your clients that 
yes, maybe you're the agency of record, but you are using a tool that is going to look at your data. And in some cases, if you don't set the right safeguards, they may also use that campaign data that you fed it to make further refinements to its algorithms. Um, and that could get a little tricky. Uh, but so what we'll talk about here today, so primer on Gen AI, a couple of script building demos. We can go off track here based on what people want us to do. Uh, but those were four ideas that I had, and then we'll do some Q&A. Um, now, uh, an interesting stat that I heard from uh, Microsoft yesterday, and Nava was in that meeting too, So, but they were asking Gen Zers about their use of Gen AI. 77% um, say they find it pretty easy to use, and 74% thought it's actually quite helpful. Um, and that's kind of an interesting conversation, right? Like, is this kind of like all hype, or is this useful in actual business situations? And so that's my goal today is to take some of that cool stuff and turn it into very specific use cases. Um, that you might be able to walk away with today. Uh, but Gen AI is, is like super cool, right? And I said that I've lived in the Silicon Valley for 30 plus years. And I love it here because there's all this innovation and like we see the self-driving cars driving around here before anyone else. We're like in the middle of Gen AI. We were at the forefront of the internet. And so what we've seen is that every 30 years, the Silicon Valley seems to come out with this new technology that's really uh, fundamentally shifting the marketplace. And so... What we've seen is that in the 1960s, the microchips came in and they made the marginal cost of computing go down to zero. And what that means in simple terms is that you and I, we all use spreadsheets to do data analysis. Well, before computers, before fast computers, like that was a lot of data processing, a lot of manual math that was very time consuming and expensive. The microchip made it come to a point where you and I never even think about the fact that there is actually a cost associated to using Excel because that cost is virtually zero because microprocessors have gotten so fast. And then 30 years later, the internet comes along and they make the marginal cost of distribution go to zero. So if you've used microchips to create something really cool, you can now start distributing it at virtually no cost. You don't have to get a CD into a music store. You don't have to get a video cassette into a blockbuster. All of this is being distributed online. Um, and so that fundamentally shifted a lot of business models. Step forward another 30 years and the 2020s, and now we're seeing Gen AI. Uh, we've seen AI, by the way, that's been around since the late 1950s. But generative AI, as we're seeing it today, is holding the promise of the creation of content is basically becoming free. So when I made that video of myself as Ken, I didn't really have to think all that much about the cost of it. it. It was all of a sudden really possible, and that cost is going to keep decreasing. And one of the coolest examples that I've heard in the Silicon Valley here from one of the venture capitalists is that we're talking about, well, we do these 15-second video clips, right? And we do little gen, uh, scripts on chat GPT. But there is a world that's not that far away in which there's going to be a version of Netflix which has movies that are generated on the fly for you based on what you like. It is going to write a script. It is going to turn that into the video. And that's going to be a movie just for you. Like, that's crazy. But we're going to get to that place in not too many years. And that's the promise that we have to be ready for, right? That's the, um, that's the future we're soon going to live in. So if we're not thinking ahead about where we're going to get there and how you can um, benefit from that, I think you're going to miss some opportunities. But that's what I think is super, super cool. Now, but do you think I'm crazy uh, here in Silicon Valley? Oh, I, your... I, I don't want to derail the presentation, so I'm, I'm, I'm unsure what, when and where to chime in. But one thing I actually think is very interesting about um, the, the Netflix piece, we think about the writer strikes and the actor strikes and the idea of the, the artist and protecting the artist. And there is something to be said for human and machine working together and, and having efficiency versus replacing. Um, I think the people that are going to be winners in this conversation are those that embrace the idea of symbiosis. Um, the ones that are going to be losers are going to be the ones that either try to entirely rely on the machine and then come up with bad content. Uh, Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land just put out a whole bunch of rules around it cannot be fully written with AI. You have to actually prove that you, a human, wrote it. Um, and then those that try to do things entirely as humans, they're, they're going to be stuck. So... Again, one of the reasons why I think this topic is really interesting uh, is it we're already taking the scripting and the automation piece, uh, which is already automation, but how can we then enhance what we think about? Because humans have biases. That was a very long tangent that hopefully opened up more, more conversation points. 
Well, and I also love the conversation that Hans was sort of teeing up. So uh, the wires directly into the brain. So Hans, the company you're talking about is called Neuralink. It's an Elon Musk company, and they just did the first successful implant of wires into a human's brain. Uh, the premise is this is going to help people who have uh, disconnects in the brain. So they did uh, quadriplegics, for example, by fixing the brain, you can reconnect some of the neurons and get them to walk again. Um, but, but I think secretly what his real mission is, is to prepare humans for a world in which we compete against AI. And so if we can have the human plus the AI together, if we can basically have GPT built into our brains, we're going to stand a chance of surviving when, uh, when the AI comes from us. And that's a bit of a doomsday. I, I don't necessarily agree with that point of view. Um, but yeah, it's a possibility. So, you know, we can discuss that in a different forum. Uh, but, but I think it's also really important to, to fundamentally level set on the types of AI, right? So AI has existed since the 1950s, and a lot of that AI has been very statistical. So doing the stuff that you see on the left of that slide. So it's about saying uh, we've trained a model to look at pictures and to understand which pictures represent a cat or a dog or a different animal. And so now, based on that, you can go and ask that system, here's a picture. Is this a picture of a cat? And based on statistics, it can tell you, yes, this is probably a cat or no, this is probably not a cat. Now, generative AI is based on the same statistical models. It's uh, also based on machine learning, but it's taken that to the next level. And now what we're able to do is say, imagine um, a, a picture of a cute kitten sitting on a sidewalk in pink fur. Uh, now, when I said pink fur, I was hoping that the kitten would actually have pink fur, but the system was smart enough to know that there's generally no pink kittens. So they put a, a pink fur coat on the kitten. But these images were generated by AI, right? And so this is a completely different way of how AI works. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you ask generative AI to do something with a budget, predict a budget, or uh, help you set a cost per click, you're going to get a made up answer. And that's because GPT is a large language model, and its job is to predict the next word based on statistical models. So if you say, what should probably come after the words, the cat, it considers its language models, and it says, well, we could put in meows or barks. And it says, well, meows typically appears closer to the word cat, seems to be semantically more close to it than the word barks. So probably the sentence should be the cat meows. But by that same token, why didn't it say the cat first? That would have been an equally valid answer um, and very reasonable, right? So, but that, that that is to keep in mind, it's basically doing these things based on what it's seen historically in the past. And it's not connecting directly into CPC databases or budget databases. We've also seen that GPT in its native form is quite unreliable at math. So if you ask it one plus one equals, it does that language analysis and it says, well, typically we see the number two fairly close to those other characters. So the answer is probably two. Um, it is becoming more of a calculator type system or if you ask it math questions, it'll actually use math to, to find the answer as opposed to guessing it based on language. But there is a notion of drift. And so we, we saw this in a Stanford study, which analyzed GPT-4 on an, a question, which was, is uh, this particular number a prime number? And GPT-4 got it right 80% of the time. Right? If, if you do the, an actual math operation on that, you should get it right 100% of the time. So even 80% is not fantastic. But here the notion of drift came in. And three months later, the same question was asked to GPT. And the answer uh, reliability had gone down to 50%. So it actually gotten worse over time at predicting the correct answer because the large language model was evolving and something was taking it in the wrong direction. So that, that's a really big caveat. As we all deploy scripts and do math with scripts, you can't always just trust it. Now, let's show you some quick examples of the simple stuff that you can use GPT for. So you see at the top of each of these boxes, a prompt that I've given GPT. And the thing in the gray box is the thing that you would fill in with your information. And so it's really good at finding keyword suggestions for a URL or coming up with ad text suggestions for that. By the way, if you just ask it to come up with keywords for a URL, you should tell it to go and visit that URL because if you don't, there's no guarantee it's actually gonna open the page. And it's just gonna make inferences from the domain name, as well as the, the path of the landing page. And from that, it can pretty well guess what the page is probably about, but it's not actually gonna look at it. So you have to ask it to use its built-in browser or to use the Bing browser to go and get that page and then get you the keyword suggestions. 
Um, and now it's using a lot of semantics here. And so one thing that I think is really cool is you can take a prompt and you say, categorize a long list of keywords into whatever classification. And so you can go to a keyword tool, whichever one you like, you can grab a list of thousands of keywords and you can say, classify this, categorize it. And so it comes up with a categorization without me having to teach it how to categorize things. And so I could use this categorization as a foundation for building ad groups. So saving me a ton of time. And then on the flip side of that, once you're running on Google ads and you're, you get broad match keywords and you get search terms that aren't exactly your keyword, how do you sift through thousands of search terms to figure out which ones Google potentially didn't make the best decision about. Well, again, take that list of thousands of search terms, put it into GPT and say, we run a PPC management software. Which of these keywords would you have ranked as low relevance for that type of company? And so it, it does its classification. And now I can look at the list, the bottom of the list, the least relevant, and that is my focus. And that helps me save time, but still ultimately make a human decision about which keywords I'll add in as negative keywords. Of course, in just a minute, we'll also take a look at how you can take this methodology and perhaps build some scripts that help you automate some of this as well. All right, so uh, the scripting section, uh, the easiest way to get started, and I wanted to throw this out there because uh, it's been in a few presentations. This is a post that I did on search engine land, but what if we could take GPT and get it to suggest ad headlines, which I've just shown you how you can go to chat GPT, put in a prompt, and it'll give you headlines. But what if we could automate that? What if we could say we're going to get the data from an existing Google Ads account and put in all the different headline variations? And we're going to find out when we're not using all 15 variations that Google allows us to use. And then we're going to give the, the variations that we do have to GPT. And we're going to say, find me more headlines like this. So it's basically going to fill in the blanks. And I'm going to zoom in on this uh, a little bit if I can. Actually, sorry, it's not letting me zoom in on the presentation side. But uh, but if you look at the, the green fields on the spreadsheet, these are basically the ones that GPT has filled in with a suggestion for a new headline. Now, the other cool thing is this, in, this is in the format that is compatible with bulk uploads. So you can take this spreadsheet, download it as a CSV, upload it back into Google Ads, and it's going to put in those headlines. So it's, it's a real time saver, very easy to run. And if you want to try it, uh, scan that QR code or use that link right there to get yourself a copy of that script. All right. So I'm going to, but now if I go ahead, I'm going to turn off my screen here and go to chat GPT. But uh, Just while, while you're, you're transitioning, um, one thing I found really interesting about this, the, the level setting is the idea of drift. Um, I don't think enough people actually take that into consideration. And now that we're living in a privacy first world where data is modeled anyway, uh, what you ask for not only has to be very specific, but you need to be comfortable reworking and re-engineering those prompts uh, just to make sure that you're consistently getting the right thing. That other golden tip that I think everyone should take away from kind of the, the level setting section uh, is the idea of telling ChatGPT to actually go in and explore the site um, I think not enough people consider that if you tell a robot to do something or you tell a computer to do something, it will do the, the exact thing that you tell it to do. Um, and much like people get upset with Google for not crawling the right bit, then they find out that they de-indexed it or they put it as a nofollow. There's a number of, of pieces there. So um, really good golden tip, especially as you might be building out Pmax campaigns with um, URL expansion, or whether you're managing your SEO and your PPC together, um, really, really important to kind of see not only how does ChatGPT view your site, um, could that inform how Google or Microsoft view your site? Cool. And so um, we're in ChatGPT now. Uh, and we're going to write some scripts. So the one that I wanted to start with is something fairly basic, but quite helpful. Uh, what if we wanted to take some Google Ads data and export it into a Google spreadsheet and do that automatically? By the way, we're not really talking much here about what Google Ads scripts are, but I should probably spend 30 seconds on it. So these are pieces of JavaScript that you can copy and paste into a Google Ads account, and then you can set them on an automation. And through this JavaScript capability, uh, they will automate certain tasks that you otherwise would have had to do manually. 
they are kind of a, an easier version to use of technology than the API. API is a fairly heavy lift. A script can be, you know, you write the code, you copy paste it into Google Ads, you don't have to maintain a server infrastructure and you can preview it, you can run it automatically. So it's, it's like, it's really fantastic for marketers. If you haven't tried it, I'll show you how to do it, but it's, uh, it's super cool. All right, so I'm gonna go into GPT and I'm gonna ask it to start with, and sorry, I'm doing one other thing here on the tab on the side. Boom. Now this is okay. the this is where audience participation is absolutely encouraged. If you have prompts or if you have scripts that you would like for us to explore um, live or troubleshoot live, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'm keeping an eagle eye on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, Fred has a slew of really good examples that we've just seen a lot of our customers benefit from. So I've seen uh, presentations about script generation in GPT, and then they, they do a lot of the prompting where they say behave like a, an advanced scripts writer. I find that you often don't have to do that. I mean, GPT is not stupid. So if you ask it for a, an ad script, it kind of knows what that means, and it's able to give you really good uh, inputs. So here I had a very simple prompt. I'll go back to what that prompt was, but I said, can you help me write a Google ad script to get data about campaigns and add them to a Google spreadsheet? So I was fairly specific in what I asked, but not so specific as to mention things about which campaigns or what date range do I want data for or what data do I want included? Uh, but it makes some guesses and it says, okay, well, great. Here's uh, how Google Scripts works. So you're going to have to set up a spreadsheet. You're going to have to access the script editor. Uh, and then you're going to have to write the script and you're going to have to replace your spreadsheet ID with uh, the one that you generated in your sheet. But here's a supposedly fully functioning piece of code. Um, now, you know, I don't speak code. I mean, I do, but say that you do, you don't. That you you can't quite follow exactly what the script is doing. This is okay. this is for the this is for the novice. Fred, the, no. Fred, we we all know Fred speak code, but I this this is for the novice who don't speak code. So one thing you could do is you can say, can you explain in pseudocode, um, or if you didn't know what that was, pseudocode, or plain English, uh, what this script is doing. So we'll ask it that. Okay, so now hopefully it's going to give a little bit of an explanation. So it says, yeah, here's what the script is going to do. It's going to set up a connection to the spreadsheet. It's going to access the active sheet. It's going to prepare the spreadsheet by clearing anything that's on it. That's helpful to know. So if I wanted this to be a cumulative spreadsheet, this is actually going to clear it every time it runs. It's going to make a header row so that I know which metrics are what. It's going to get all the campaigns from Google Ads account. So that's interesting, too, because maybe I don't want all my campaigns. Maybe I just want the ones that have some data. I'm not saying I'm going to fetch today's statistics. Uh, that's interesting, too, because maybe I don't want today's statistics. Maybe I want uh, this week to date or some other date range. And so now you get a full explanation of what the script is doing. OK, so now that I understand, uh, I might say something like, um, Let's go with the date range. And Anava, you can throw in other examples of things we might want to change, right? But say, can you change this script to pull last 30 days data instead? Um, and a, forgive my typos. I mean, I don't have to fix those. GPT, again, is smart enough to understand what I meant. Um, so I'm not going to waste time fixing those typos on the fly. But now, um, it comes back and it says, well, you don't have to redo the whole script, but basically the line that said, get stats for today, you can change that to uh, this function for the last 30 days. Now, what if we want to do comparisons, uh, comparing last 30 days to the previous period or last 30 days to uh, last same period last year? Okay, that's pretty cool. So uh, let's try that next because I have stumbled quite, or GPT has stumbled on that quite a bit. Uh, but notice what I did, right? So actually, I should let it finish the code. And then, okay, it's done writing the code. So now I'm going to say copy that code. Um, I do have to make a new spreadsheet. So let me share this tab instead. And, and I apologize, but I do have to go back and forth between tabs. 
Uh, never but, apologize. It's thank you for understanding. It's so sheets.new. A lot of people don't know this little command, but if you go into Google Chrome and say sheets.new, it's just going to create a new spreadsheet. You don't have to go through the whole Google Drive bit. Um, and so we're going to call it GPT ads data example. Okay, there we go. And then it said all it really needs is the ID of that sheet, which happens to be this whole long bit of code. If you didn't know what the ID was, you could, of course, ask GPT to help you figure that one out. Um, and so I'm going to need that. I don't think the code showed what, what your, um, I think the screen cut it off. Oh, because the URL. Yeah, sorry. The URL yeah. is not being shown. Um, so the URL portion here, I'll copy paste it into one of the cells, but that's good to know. Um, so this is the URL of that spreadsheet. So the uh, actual ID portion, which you can see now, I think, is anything mm -hmm. between these two slashes. So that's what I'm going to have to grab. Uh, and I'll put that in here so I can grab it quickly later. Uh, but let's go back to chat GPT. Um, again, copy it. I accidentally copied the code over it. And then I'm going to go into uh, Google Ads. And in Google Ads, I'm going to say I'm going to go into bulk actions scripts. Um, and I'm going to make a new script. And so that piece of code that GPT has given me, I'm going to paste that into the new code. I think it's worth noting that it's Google, the, the race of which is slower, Google versus ChatGPT for generating uh, the page. Uh, Google typically loses, uh, which one day maybe that'll be fixed. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. We had to have to wait quite a bit here. So the, the next thing you have to do is preview that code. Um, so it's going to basically come back and say that there is an authorization error. And that means that you have to authorize these scripts to be executed. So as I click that, uh, I'm not going to show you the little verification screen, but basically you log in with your Google Ads account. Um, and I, I will show it to you instead. So it says this script is going to be able to do these things, and you have to be okay with that. Now, it, this, this is really Google services talking to other Google services, and you've controlled what the script does, so there's not that much risk in it. But if you generated bad code, it could go in and conceivably delete every single spreadsheet that you have in your Google Drive, right? So don't write stupid stuff, and always preview the script before executing. Previewing it means that um, that it's not going to make changes, but it's going to tell you what changes are making. Okay, so I gotta share my screen again. One shameless plug I'll make for Optimizer uh, while while you're doing this. One of the reasons our rule engine has both a alert and execute function uh, is that sometimes you want to just see when would a rule run, um, and getting that alert is a really useful way to know. Okay, I trust. The rule to do the thing. I trust the automation to do the thing. I'm going to let it do the thing. So I'll always, always preview. Even if you know it's correct, even if you have the utmost confidence in the technology, always preview. Okay. And then you see that I've copied and pasted in that URL right there. Um, I'll make the screen a little bit bigger so people can see more easily. But so that was the only thing the script told me or GPT told me I had to do. We've already gone through the preview. So now if I can find that preview button again, um, it might work, it might fail. We're about to find out. So uh, logging, so it says session ID, session is not defined at main. Okay, so this is uh, actually good because I wanted to show how errors happen. So I'm gonna copy whatever that error is and I'm gonna go back to GPT and I'm gonna say I got this error. And then I just based in what I got as an error. Um, and it's going to have some ideas. One thing actually that's very interesting about this versus other prompts, um, and I'm curious if folks in the audience have noticed this, when you tell ChatGPT you got it wrong, it will apologize for getting it wrong and come up with other solutions. Whereas this very matter of the fact, this is the error. It didn't bother apologizing. It it kind of tried to just go straight into deducing what the answer is. And I'm curious if that's 
just the nature of the prompt or is that it kind of not taking ownership? Is it kind of saying like human error is the issue? Yeah, it's always been uh, very confident in itself, I think, right, is one of the things we've certainly seen. Um, but I'll show you in a minute how you can create GPTs that are maybe a little more friendly and apologize for mistakes they make along the way. So here I'm going to copy paste that in. So you see, I'm just updating the code with what it gave me. And then it also said I have to put in the account time zone uh, in this bit right here. And luckily GPT uh, gave me an example of what these time zones might be. So if I'm in America, New York, I can grab that or I could go and look up which specific time zone we are in. Uh, my accounts being mostly in the Pacific time zones, but I'm just gonna use that for the example. And we'll preview that again. Okay, we're still looking at the logs here. Fingers crossed it works. Fingers crossed, it's now giving errors right now. And it says it's done. Okay, so now I'm like, it's done, but what, what did it just do? Um, but I'm smart enough that I can go back to my spreadsheet. And there you go, you got campaign data in the spreadsheet. Now, uh, this is great, but you look at this and maybe you have a couple of other things that could have been better, right? So now you can have a conversation just like you would have with a developer and you might say, uh, I don't need campaigns with no impressions. Also, can you put the spreadsheet URL in the logs when the script is done. Okay. Again, I, and I'm not being particularly friendly here. I'm just giving it. Uh, okay. And I seem to be in a test here from GPT where it's actually running side by side responses. Uh -huh. It's hard for me to instantly judge which code is better. So I'm just going to trust that the first one hopefully works. But what's interesting here too, this is an illustration of like as a large language model where I said the cat purrs or the cat meows equally would have been fine, right? And so just like that with scripts, there is no one right way to write the script. There's multiple ways you could go about it. Um, and it's just giving you different variations. So uh, so anyway, it makes changes here. And I'll just read the, suit, the, the actual code for a minute. So I said, I don't want anything that doesn't have um, impressions. So here it's added some code that if stats get impressions is greater than zero, that's when it's going to get the data for me. Um, so that was one change. And I also said at the end, I want you to output the spreadsheet URL. So it says here, log or log, spreadsheet URL, and then the URL. So a very nice way to make changes on the fly. And again, I can copy paste that code over and actually do something with it. Now, um, I'm happy to take questions, but I'm going to move on to the next example. So with the code that we have here, um, Actually, I, I want to do one more thing that I should do. I want to get segmented data. So I want to get the data for the, uh, the past year segmented by week, for example. Can, so uh, can you see my GPT? Can you give me the metrics segmented by week for the last 180 days? Just while this is populating, one thing that might be useful to talk through is that is a, is a really awesome script. How does one justify building the time to make that script versus just checking your, your native platform or using a third party tool? Um, I think one of the things that I personally struggle with quite a bit when it comes to PPC and ChatGPT is it feels like a lot of the things that you can do with ChatGPT are fairly redundant to what you can do natively. So kind of getting that, bridging that gap of this is functionality that is far more efficient to do this way, or this is functionality that the human would struggle to get an, an accurate answer, I think would be, would be really interesting to dive into. Yeah. 
And so that's a good example, right? What we're doing here is pretty basic, but now you can take it to the next level. And Nava, like you said, what if you wanted to pull the data for multiple date ranges and see like a continuous trend towards worse performance? Now it's like having your own developer. You're not stuck to the capabilities that Google provides you, but you can actually go and have that conversation. So actually, I would ha prefer to have you fetch data for each of the past three months and tell me which campaigns are uh, lower impressions every month. Uh, and that's not the best way of express. Like I could, probably could have been more clear about what some of these things mean, but again, it'll probably pick up on what I meant. And so it starts to explain what it's doing. Uh, we don't have a ton of time to like really read the details of this, but but that's the capability you can get to. Um, th there's also an example. So and, and maybe um, here, let me jump to that script that I had. Where did it go? I don't have it anymore. Um, yeah, so what, what I want to do next is show you, once you have data, how to do an analysis with that data through GPT. Okay, and so I, I preloaded that yesterday. Uh, impressions over time chart. Okay, so I had downloaded, I gone to GPT, um, and I had conversations. So I ha already had a spreadsheet, Google Ads data from um, script. So I'm going to find that data. Um, so it's, and it can, kind of what I want to get at here is that you generate this data, but you add a time segment to it. So I'd already prepared that somewhere else. So I'm just going to grab that. Now you can give that spreadsheet to uh, GPT, and then you can ask it to do an analysis on that, or you can go and do some um, charting of that. Fred, one, there's actually a really good conversation comment I'd love for you to weigh in on um, mm -hmm. just while we're, we're troubleshooting, specifically around testing time. Um, Dave Roser uh, put out a really good point that ChatGPT can speed up the writing, but the testing, and this kind of played out during the demo, can take a little bit longer than had he have done it himself, um, especially, and, I, and it would apply for you as well. You're a very experienced coder. Um, how do you mitigate that? How is that just drift, and that's just the nature of ChatGPT that sometimes it'll be fast, sometimes not, or is it mitigatable? Yeah, I mean, so GPT four is definitely slower, and I think GPT three point five uh, can do the same things much more quickly. And so, if you count by the hour, then yes, it it makes sense. Now, I mean, I mean, the way that I look at this though is. In the past, I would have had to write every single line of the script, like the stupid stuff, like connect to the service, get the data, put in the date range. Like that's just me typing and like having to fix my typos along the way. Here it's doing that in less than five minutes and the framework is there, right? And so me having a conversation in the back and forth on fixing things, I could have either done that myself, which would have taken a lot of time, or I could have used one of the developers on my optimizer team. Uh, but now I'd be going back and forth on a daily basis. They'd give me the next version. I'd be like, okay, here's my five points of feedback. And then I'd wait another day to get it back. Here I can do all of this in the course of two hours. And I can actually have a, a script that's working. Or the other thing, um, which I might illustrate if we have enough time, is I can find a script that's pre-written by someone else. I can give that to GPT and I can say, I like what it's doing, but I needed to add these metrics or I need to change this component of the analysis. And it actually fixes that, right? So it's... Uh, it, Net net for me, even though yes, I have to sit there looking at it, writing the code. That's a lot faster than me writing it or working with a developer. Um, okay, but so the other thing I want to illustrate is uh, this is the data now that I have. So Google adds data from a script, and notice that I've gotten it to put in monthly data for these different campaigns. Okay, so you can see um, some of the numbers right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download this as a CSV. Okay, and once I have it as a CSV, you can use uh, GPT's native capability, which used to be called Code Interpreter, uh, but now they've made that just like a little attachment icon right there. Uh, sorry, I'm not sharing the correct tab. Let me go back. So I'm back on GPT here. So this little attachment thing, so that code that I just downloaded, uh, I'm going to grab right there. Um, can you tell me what this data includes from Google Ads? Okay, so it's reading that data. 
Uh, it's going to tell you some stuff about the headers. It's going to talk about how there's campaigns in it. And again, this takes a minute, um, right? And this is a small analysis on a small set of data. But imagine in a minute that you can do this for much larger data sets, which would have taken you significant amount of time. Okay, so well, one, one point I want to make there, too, um, oftentimes ad platforms struggle when they have less data. So this is an opportunity where you partnering with the machine is actually a net win over trying to do it within the app platform because you're able to kind of peel peel the onion a little bit on those smaller accounts where maybe whether it's the learning period, whether it's thresholds from a privacy standpoint, you're actually able to, to dive into those insights. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we now get a good sense of what the data is in there. And, and clearly GPT is understanding what's in there. And by the way, this is using code interpreter. So if you click on this little thing here, it actually shows you that it's written Python code to do this analysis. And this is the result from Python. Now, what's cool is you don't have to set up a server to run Python. You don't have to know how to program in Python. But all of Python's capabilities are now available to you as a business person, right? If you can talk to a developer in your company, if you can talk to an analyst in your company, that's what ChatGPT is doing for you. And, and rather than you talking to a human and then waiting two hours for the human to finish their coffee break and do the work, well, I asked it, can you chart it? And there you go. Less than two minutes later, it's made me a nice little chart. Um, again, imagine what, what this can do on much bigger data sets. But this is Python. And so in Python, you do lose the uh, generative component. So now if I started asking questions about, um, like if I had a keyword analysis and I said, can you put these keywords in a table and rank them from most expensive to least expensive? It'll do that. But then if I said, can you also classify these keywords based on like their relevance? It's actually using Python code as opposed to large language models. And Python is going to be less, a lot less uh, good at doing those sorts of classifications. And that's where you have to understand the division between uh, what the generative AI is producing to understand how much you can trust that data. The other point, because we talked about drift and the fact that large language models don't give one answer that's absolutely right. If I asked it to do the same task two minutes from now, it might write a completely different piece of code that achieves the same output, but in a different manner. Now, it could make a mistake, or I could come back and I could um, try to do this analysis two weeks from now. If you can, if you have the Python code working, I recommend you actually give it to your developers, put it on your servers so that that code is frozen. If it's doing what you need it to do, Thank you, GPT, but now I'm going to put it on my machines, which are going to be faster at executing, right? Because they don't have to rewrite the code every time. And you're going to know for a fact that you've checked it once. It worked fine. It had no mistakes. And now you can trust it to do that same analysis on future accounts. And that's a really big point uh, that I want to make sure you all take away from here. One thing I, I do think is worth diving into a little bit. We've talked quite a bit about Google-centric code and Google-centric chat GPT applications. Are there any applications that, whether it's from creative standpoint or reporting standpoint, that other ad networks could could benefit from, or is it is it pretty much keyword reporting metrics? That's that's the kit and caboodle of ChatGPT. Yeah, I mean, I think the the sky's the limit here, right? And so we're doing Google ad scripts, but Microsoft have scripts as well, and there's far fewer documented examples of those. Uh, but what's nice is now you can actually do that through GPT. Um, I find myself having to do a Microsoft ad script and and they name things slightly differently. So for me, like to get in that mental space of, oh, it's it's not Google Ads app, but it's, is it Bing app or is it Microsoft app? Like, what do they call it? GPT knows, right? So it spits it out and it made a mistake. At some point I was like, hey, it came back with this error and I was like, yes. Uh, and in that case, it did apologize. And it said, uh, actually they no longer call it campaign, but they call it campaign name. And it knew and it just fixed it for me. And so any system that lets you program, you can benefit from this. And then even stuff like Facebook, right? So Facebook, I don't think has scripts, but they do have an API. So if you want to write like some API code much more quickly, um, you can do it. So this is not limited to just Google ads, fortunately. Um, disclaimer on the Facebook API. Um, and there's a question about LinkedIn ads as well. Uh, the, a the Facebook API is notoriously shaky. So on Fred's point about kind of locking in the code, 
you may need to kind of troubleshoot and rework meta ad or, or Facebook ads API more often than you would other other ad platforms just because the nature of the Facebook API. Um, do you have a LinkedIn example we want to put to chat GPT? Chat GPT? Do we want to see how uh, it does? Sorry, do LinkedIn ads have scripts? I, I believe that the, um, because the API is there, you're able to pull some reporting pieces like on audiences. Um, yeah, but this this would actually be a really good example to see, can ChatGPT affirm these things? Let's do it. So uh, I haven't written scripts for GPT, uh, through GPT for LinkedIn. Um, okay, there's my screen. We'll make a new chat. And by the way, this, what we're doing right now of kind of just diving in and playing, this is the attitude you have to have with this emerging technology. Um, there is no hard, fast, this is 100% what's there, this is 100% what's not there. Um, test and play, because at this point, no one's an expert. Everyone's learning and growing and sharing together. Yeah, I okay, kind of the way that I position that is like, we're done. Um, the world is no longer about saying I can't. It's about saying I haven't yet, right? Everything is possible now. Um, and Microsoft, by the way, has a really great Super Bowl commercial they're going to run on Sunday. You can already see it on YouTube. Uh, but it's very aspirational or inspirational. And it basically like anyone can come up with ideas for a movie. Anyone who had an idea for a script or a program can try to do it. And, and so here, um, as you see on the screen, it's basically saying, well, listen, LinkedIn ads only has an API. And here's a simple example of one automation that you could do. And then, but now you can start having that conversation um, with that GPT. Now, the other thing that I did want to point out here is uh, they've added what's called GPTs. And this name is like super confusing, right? In, uh, in OpenAI. But GPTs are subsets of chat GPT that are manipulated by, by humans. So I've written a GPT, which helps you build scripts. And so I've taught that GPT to ask questions like, when you said you want to improve performance, like what did you mean? Like, can you quantify that? Was it CPA? Was it return on ad spend? Uh, I get it to always ask questions like, are you writing this code for a single account or multi-account? Um, and so it's guiding you through the roadblocks that I often see newbie scripts developers have where they don't think about certain things. Um, or like look back windows. If you're going to do an analysis between date ranges, like what is a valid look back window? And it explains these things on the fly. And so it's like having uh, that conversation, but with a developer who's been trained by me to ask the right questions of you to get you the thing that actually does the best job in your account. And so you can find these GPTs in the GPT directory. Now this is paid. This is part of GPT-4. So you have to pay your 20 bucks a month. Uh, but you can do a search and you can say, uh, are there any GPTs that help with ad scripts? And so you can see which ones um, have a lot of usage. Uh, eventually, they'll have rankings and star ratings. But you can grab one of these. Um, and I think Niels had written one. I don't see which one that might be. But but I have my own here. So for me, it's PPC Scripts Helper. Um, and so it, it might say, I need a script for managing multiple campaigns. Any advice? And so now it's like having a conversation with me and eventually it'll spit out that scripts code that you can again, copy paste into Google ads. Um, We're, we magically have made almost all the hour uh, go in, into scripting land. We have about uh, five, 10 minutes left. Um, Want to make sure that if people have questions, you're putting them in. Uh, Dave Rosner has, how did you get into that directory? That's what uh, I want to make sure Freddie has a chance to answer that. But definitely put those questions in so we can get to them. Yeah, so uh, go to GPT. And again, you have to be on the GPT for the, the premium paid version. And then it's a button right here that says Explore GPTs. That's really useful. The other thing that I recommend people look at is uh, click on your name, go into Settings and Beta. Uh, as well as custom instructions. So in settings and beta, this is where they add in new capabilities like plugins. Uh, this used to have the, the code interpreter, which is now natively built in, which was the thing that took the attachment and then analyzed the data in that attachment through Python. That used to be a beta. Um, so that one is one. And then the other thing I really like is custom instructions. So you can tell it a little bit about your background, your preferences. 
And so when I get it to write, sometimes it's using really grandiose words or like superlatives, and I don't like those. So I tell it to avoid superlatives or grandiose language. So it avoids those. It's more direct. Um, you can also tell it about who you are, right? So if you are a scripts expert, it's going to come back and talk to you in a different way that assumes you know a lot of these basic concepts as opposed to someone who's never done scripts before. Um, so you could put that in here, like I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, um, but I generally understand pseudocode, so talk to me in pseudocode. So it, it, it then learns from that. Now, um, one cool thing about GPTs, and I'm sure there's a number of agencies here watching, so wouldn't it be super cool if you could have GPT know things about each of the clients that you work with? And that's kind of the promise that GPTs hold it. So GPTs, you can go through this directory and find GPTs that other people have built. Uh, but what's even cooler is you can make your own GPT. So this button here in the top right, create your own GPT. All you're going to do is have a conversation with chat GPT that's like, oh, okay, one of my clients is uh, Adidas. And Adidas operates in these countries and they sell these kinds of products. And here's a PDF with their brand guidelines. And here's how they think about results. Like, do they care about CPA, ROAS? How's it different by market, right? So you overload it with all this information and then it builds a GPT. And when you have a conversation with that version of GPT, it knows how to answer based on that client. And so you make a GPT for each of your clients. And now the, the GPT system in general is that much more useful for you because you don't have to, every time you start a new conversation, you don't have to be like, oh, and, and here's all the 500 things I need to remind you about that per pertain to this client and not that client. So it, it kind of like stores it in long-term memory and makes it more accessible. So highly recommend you play with GPTs and make your own. $20 a month and you basically have a project manager for your for your agency. That's That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then even if you write scripts now through these different GPTs, like if you said, uh, I'll write me a script that improves performance because it knows how that client defines performance and what their CPA threshold is, it's probably going to put in the right values from the get-go. So you have to have less of a back and forth and again, save a ton of time along the way. We probably have time for one more major question. If anyone wants to chime in with a question or Fred, do you want to give kind of final thoughts, main takeaways that you're, you're hoping folks walk away with. The, the GPT one is gold. Um, I think that's the number one takeaway. And I really love that you saved it for the end of the webinar. So that only those that stayed for the end. Yeah. There's so much more <laughs> I wanted to show, but it, but it is a little hard to go back and forth between the different screens and there's so much, but, but, but hopefully I've illustrated how you can use GPT to write a script, have a conversation with it to enhance the capabilities and make it do what you want it to do. You've seen where to copy paste it into Google Ads, how to execute it, how to make it log stuff so you understand what it's doing along the way and how to solve some bugs as well. Um, so really, I, I want people to be enthusiastic about scripts, feel like there's no boundaries for you to being a scripts developer and automating your workflows. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I will put in a little pitch for Optimizer. So we do a lot of these cool things for you where you don't have to worry about scripts. We do the ongoing maintenance. We have really cool tools, real, uh, really cool data insights. So check that out if you never have. Uh, we're pretty reasonably priced as well. So would love, and we have a free trial. Um, and I talk about scripts a lot. So if this was your first time seeing me talk about it, please look me up for future webinars and uh, we'll go deeper and uh, read my blogs. Follow me on LinkedIn, follow Nava on LinkedIn. Use Duda for creating websites. They're an amazing tool as well. There's a really good question that snuck in at the last second that I want to make sure we can address. So is it possible to build GPT automations? So for example, crawl the landing pages and then write me RSAs for it. Yes, there are tools that are um, allowing you to do automations like Zapier for GPT. This is, this is interesting because I think a lot of people now think about going to chat GPT to do a thing. Um, and, but what you've just expressed is more of a, an automation thing. So Zapier has GPT integrations. Optimizer has GPT integrations. So if you're like, I want to get ad suggestions for all of my ad groups, well, then you might actually want to look at Optimizer because that already has ad management capabilities that are now enhanced with GPT's large language models. Zapier and its automation capability is already enhanced with things that say, okay, at this step in the automation, go and do something in GPT. 
right? So, so, so look at those existing top of class uh, tools because they've been adding that stuff rather than always coming back to GPT in the first place. But to the point earlier, um, you always can do it. You just might need to troubleshoot and you might just need to kind of finagle the code. So it's a question of, is your time worth more or is your money worth more? Um, we are at the minute point. So I'm going to kind of flounder a little bit, just give people a little bit more time if they want to get a question in, or we can sign off here and thank Fred very, very much for an incredibly insightful and wonderful webinar. Thank you. And right. uh, yeah, happy to engage more afterwards. So Frederick Vallis on LinkedIn, Nava Hopkins on LinkedIn. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> <you're all> right. <laughs> Thanks everyone have for watching. And thanks, Duda, for hosting. Yes, thank you, Duda. Cheers, guys. And thank you for everyone for the great questions.